Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 322 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, and I am thrilled to announce a new marketing opportunity available from Advanced Compliance Solutions called the Compliance Alliance. It is a three-step program which will provide you and your team a background into compliance and the FCPA so you can consider how best to promote your product or services as they fit into the needs of a compliance officer. It includes a 30-day boot camp, sponsoring a podcast series, and in-person training. Interested parties should contact Tom Fox, myself, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Today you're in for a real treat because I have Eric Feldman. Eric is a senior vice president at Affiliated Monitors. Eric is a longtime government employee who went into uh, business at Affiliated Monitors, and they do professional monitoring of companies, both after a resolution of some type of enforcement action, but also for a wide variety of other reasons. Obviously, uh, many people are aware of external monitors in an FCPA enforcement action, but Eric explains how monitors are used really in a much wider variety at the federal, state, and even local level. It's a fascinating uh, episode, and I think you will uh, learn quite a bit from it. It comes in at uh, just over 22 minutes. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. So I am here with Eric Feldman. We are both attending the European Compliance and Ethics Institute. Eric is the Senior Vice President at Affiliated Monitors. He is giving a presentation tomorrow. So I thought it might be a good time to uh, sit down and uh, have you tell us a little bit about Affiliated Monitors, your role with the company, and a little preview of your presentation. So Eric, with that somewhat long-winded introduction, welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> Pleasure to uh, be with you. So uh, tell us about Affiliated Monitors. What do you guys do? I, I don't know a little of your background, but many of my audience members may not know as much as I do. Well, Affiliated Monitors uh, was formed back in 2004, uh, originally uh, as a solution, uh, alternative solution to uh, individual licensed professionals and companies uh, getting in trouble with regulators at the state and federal level, uh, and affiliated provide an, alt an alternative, essentially uh, corporate probation, if you will, uh, a monitoring solution uh, to keep a company or a licensed professional in business uh, and uh, remediate any of the issues that uh, were brought forth by the regulator. Uh, instead of losing a license or uh, prosecuting a, a company or taking a company off of a, of a major uh, federal contract. Uh, it, we were one of the earlier uh, firms to do monitoring, uh, and up till today now, we have expanded our, uh, our focus not just on state and federal regulators, but really any area around the country uh, that might require uh, a compliance and integrity monitoring solution. So I'd like to get to that in a minute, uh, but many of my listeners are going to be familiar with the FCPA and a monitorship under that, but the remit of uh, affiliated monitors is much broader than that, and you specifically mentioned state monitorships. Could you explain uh, the types of state monitorships you might engage in? Sure. So uh, at the state attorney general level, uh, state AGs have become much more aggressive, uh, particularly in areas of like consumer protection. And there are a number of agreements in states. Uh, for example, New York, uh, I believe, calls them agreements of discontinuance. And uh, as a result of those agreements, uh, monitors are uh, required of a company to ensure that they comply with uh, whatever it is they agreed to. Uh, to fix the consumer issue. So as an example, uh, we are uh, the monitors around the country uh, on a New York State uh, agreement of discontinuance of a major pharmacy chain. Uh, we're actually doing two major pharmacy chains. And the, uh, one of the issues was that the pharmacy was not providing translation services uh, to uh, Chinese uh, speaking uh, 
patients and customers in the, in the United States. In the United States, uh, which is a requirement in most states that there be a uh, access to an 800 number uh, to get uh, pharmacy counseling uh, by the pharmacist before they uh, dispense the a new prescription to a to a customer. Uh, this chain wasn't doing it on a routine and systemic basis. Uh, the state attorney general in New York prosecuted them. They came to this agreement, and our role is to monitor pharmacies across the country to ensure they're now complying. Uh, so that kind of a role is a more of a secret shopper kind of role, where we have people going into the pharmacies uh, of various uh, language capabilities, going in and, and filling prescriptions. Uh, and it informs not only the state uh, attorney general about the compliance, uh, but even more important, and that sort of gets to the affiliated monitor's philosophy, we're providing good information to the company themselves and providing some value so they know where uh, any compliance gaps might exist. And they find it very helpful. And in many cases, companies will keep us on beyond uh, the period of performance of an agreement because they want a third party to independently test whether their programs and uh, uh, efforts toward ethics and compliance are effective. So one of the things that uh, certainly you and your team are familiar with, but that once again the anti-corruption compliance officer may not be as familiar with, are the use of monitors in the government contracts. And that is a very wide, uh, broad-ranging monitorships, but I was wondering if you could describe just sort of the breadth and scope of what you guys do. Is it DOD only? Is it Department of Labor to Department of Defense to any other department? How does that really work into what you guys do? That's a great question. So uh, when I joined Affiliated back in 2011 after a, a 30 plus year in, in federal service, uh, mostly in the inspector general community, my sole focus at the time was on federal government contracts. Um, as a, a federal IG, uh, I worked at trying to get our contractors to uh, be more compliant, but more importantly, to create the kind of values-based ethics uh, program within the companies to prevent recidivism. I had about 150 auditors and investigators at uh, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is the spy satellite agency, billions of dollars a year executed about 90 to 95 percent on contract. Uh, we kept having the same problems with the same contractors over and over again. The recidivism was uh, extremely high. Uh, working with the National Procurement Fraud Task Force at the time, uh, when it was chaired by Paul McNulty, mm -hmm. uh, what we tried to do was uh, get some systemic changes in the companies. And I worked very hard with uh, lots of our, our, uh, our contractors to create an ethics and compliance system uh, that changed the culture of these companies and created uh, a willingness of the employees to comply. Uh, I view ethical culture as a foundational internal control. Being an old auditor, that's sort of my uh, my thing. I, I, you know, people think culture is a uh, squishy social science concept. I view it more from a an audit control process. People don't want to comply because the environment uh, really encourages them not to. Right. Then they're not going to comply, no matter how great your internal control system is. That's sort of a long way of saying that uh, this is a problem with hundreds and hundreds of contractors that do work for the government. So uh, our focus in the government side is working with suspension and debarment officials. And we do that in all agencies, not just the Department of Defense. Uh, we do it uh, really across the board. Um, and uh, when companies are uh, suspended or proposed for debarment, uh, we will serve as the independent monitor. And the SDOs, suspension and debarment officials, have been very uh, sort of progressive, many of them, particularly in DOD, uh, about focusing on culture and changing the culture. So you would start out by doing a baseline assessment of the company's uh, ethics and compliance and ethical culture, uh, followed by 
several follow-up reviews to see if they're implementing your recommendations. Um, our goal was really to ensure success of, of the company. And in many instances, we're able, if the company is very aggressive in implementing our recommendations, we're able to get them off the agreement early. Uh, one big case of an uh, international consulting firm that was suspended by the uh, Department of the Air Force. It's a three-year agreement, which is typical. Uh, after two, we were able to recommend to the SDO that that company be uh, released from the terms of the administrative agreement uh, because they had achieved everything they needed to achieve. Uh, we try to use that as a model for a lot of the work that we do um, outside of the SDO community. Uh, recently, there have been more uh, uh, monitoring efforts coming out of regulatory agencies, some proactive, some more reactive. For example, uh, we are the monitors for AT&T and DirecTV. Uh, uh, we monitor the uh, merger uh, conditions for the Federal Communications Commission. That's proactive. No one did anything wrong. Right. Uh, but it was an effort on the part of the FCC to get an independent third party to ensure that the conditions of the merger that they established, uh, and there were multiple different conditions, some involving um, uh, social programs and, and low-cost internet, some involving educational institutions, uh, some involving fiber to the premises and expanding the availability of fiber. Uh, we have teams that uh, ensure that at and is doing what it says it was going to do. at and is finding it very helpful uh, because we're helping improve their credibility with the government. The government finds it helpful because they now know from an independent that at and is doing what it says it's going to do. Uh, so it's a win-win for everyone and at a cost that is uh, uh, not even a small rounding error on the cost of the, the merger. Well, that really leads into an area that, frankly, I'm the most excited about for you and your company, which is the monitorship concept, but used in a, not even a preventative, but a prescriptive method or manner, and by which I mean you would come into a company that's not under investigation, that's not subject of an enforcement action, and actually use those monitoring skills to help them improve their culture and their compliance program. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Sure, and, and that is my favorite thing. Uh, when I started this about six years ago, uh, it was very rare to get a company to agree to uh, having a third party come in at a cost. Uh, to them, and and really, uh, it's an intru relatively intrusive process, um, and you you'd have to have a burning platform for the company to agree to something like that, and it was typically as a result of a court or government action. Right. Uh, uh, as time went on, and really the last two years or so, uh, there have been more and more companies that are watching others in their industry. Uh, really take a, a big hit uh, from DOJ aggressive enforcement action, uh, from regulatory action, and they don't want to go down those roads. And so they are taking the requirement in the federal sentencing guidelines for conducting a independent assessment on a periodic basis. Um, they're taking that very seriously. So we have companies coming into us asking for an assessment of their ethics and compliance posture, which means not just the program, are we doing the right things, and are those things effective, but looking at the culture. And you know, there are lots of different organizations that can look at programmatics. Uh, the big consulting firms can do it, law firms can do it. Aren't too many that do what we do which is solely independent assessments and uh, a culture focus. And we go in and assess the strength of the ethical culture. And we do that in a variety of ways through uh, a lot of employee engagement, uh, employee uh, focus groups, interviews, surveys. Um, we touch people at all levels of the organization to really answer the question which most companies have a hard time answering, is my program effective? 
is the messaging that's coming from the top of the organization actually getting down to the bottom, to the people that are managing the business on a day-to-day -day basis? And in answering that question, we provide a roadmap on how to uh, close any gaps. Uh, and so they can hold that report up to any government official or regulator in the future and say, we've done our due diligence. We have uh, filled gaps. We have, at our own expense and on our own volition, we've hired an independent monitor that applied the same standards as if the Department of Justice required a monitorship. Uh, and that can be a very valuable process uh, for companies. In addition to the uh, U.S. sentencing guidelines, that concept is certainly enshrined in the 2012 FCPA guidance and enshrined in the uh, February release of the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And there's a variety of techniques and tactics to engage in monitoring, but this is one that I, really resonates with me, and I think you're right that there are actually very few entities doing this uh, on an ongoing basis. There may be the odd one-off uh, person that would do it, but uh, really I think you guys are, are in many ways leading the industry in that type of monitoring. So I hope that the, you can continue to do that. You can continue to spread the message about that. And as the Department of Justice uh, suggests strongly that uh, compliance be operationalized, that uh, other folks will take advantage of uh, these services. Uh, I was wondering, uh, for people who don't know Affiliated Monitors, could you talk about uh, who founded it? And uh, you've talked about your role, but who are some of the principals? And do you guys have same focus, different focus? How does that all interrelate? Sure. Uh, so the company was founded by uh, Vin DeCiani, who was a uh, former Deputy Attorney General for the state of Massachusetts. His focus at the time was in the medical profession. So we really started out in healthcare. Uh, he was, uh, after he left the AG's office, he was uh, representing doctors uh, before medical boards uh, and realizing that there were really two choices at the time uh, for medical boards, to yank the doctor's license for a violation of uh, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, billing and coding issues, um, could be uh, overprescribing, uh, it could be uh, boundary violations. Uh, all kinds of things, uh, but the, the board could either yank the license or not do anything and not protect the public. And they created this as a uh, kind of a solution to provide probation to doctors. Now we do that in 35 different states. Uh, Vin started expanding that into uh, federal uh, construction and highway contracts with the big dig in Boston. As everybody right. remembers, that was a uh, a huge fiasco. There were multiple prosecutions under the False Claims Act, uh, and there were companies there that uh, had submitted false claims. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration wanted to debar them, uh, but the state of Massachusetts said, we've got a hole in the ground. What are we going to do? Because there are no other contractors with the equipment and the personnel and resources to get this job done. So that was the solution to have them monitored. Uh, and we monitored one of the biggest contractors there. Uh, and that was uh, Vin's project. And uh, it ended up very successful. There were no further incidents of false claims uh, from that particular contractor. Uh, and that sort of led and expanded uh, into a variety of areas for affiliated. Um, after I came on board, we were looking to further expand, and we brought on board uh, a, a great individual named uh, Don Stern. And Don was the uh, United States Attorney for uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, during the Clinton years. Uh, Don uh, then was uh, in private practice, did corporate investigations. Uh, so he has seen this compliance business from all sides. Uh, and he is one of the most uh, thoughtful and analytic people that I've ever met. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, our clients are very uh, fortunate to have him working on a number of our, of our cases. Um, we have recently brought on uh, a suspension and debarment official, Rod Grandin, who was uh, the Air Force suspension and debarment official and deputy general counsel. Rod uh, also chaired the interagency uh, committee on suspension and debarment. Uh, so he was a thought leader 
uh, in the government for uh, helpful and remedial suspension and debarment activity. And uh, already Rod has gotten off to a terrific start uh, helping our, our clients uh, improve their, uh, their cultures and their companies. And we recently hired, as, as you know, uh, Jay Rosen, uh, who is our vice president for business development. Uh, Jay is a unique individual, uh, you know, having uh, gotten familiar with the uh, compliance uh, industry and profession and become really a, a, a fixture at the uh, Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics Conferences, uh, well-respected uh, uh, compliance professional, uh, but he is extremely skilled in getting the word out and in uh, educating our clients uh, about the kind of services that we can provide. It's interesting for a, a company like Affiliated, uh, business development is not your typical uh, uh, you know, selling software. Uh, it's a matter of education. Right. And educating all the players uh, in this process from the companies and compliance officers themselves, their general counsels, uh, outside counsel that may represent them, and the federal agencies, uh, about the different alternatives that they have available to them uh, in order to strengthen their programs and stay out of trouble, and if they're already in trouble, how to get out of trouble. So one of the things that's amazed me about you, Eric, over the years is, uh, in addition to your day job, you uh, speak extensively, and indeed you're speaking here at the uh, European Compliance and Ethics Institute. And I was wondering if you could uh, talk about or give us a hint of, of your talk, or maybe maybe some more words, since uh, this podcast will probably be posted after your talk. Sure, sure. The um, the the talk is, is um, an interesting approach. Uh, what I decided to do is have uh, one of our clients, uh, a company that we are currently monitoring under an FCPA, a Deferred Prosecution Agreement, to have them join me uh, on a panel, really it's just the two of us, it's a co-presentation, uh, to talk about the benefits of third-party assessment. And so the participants are going to hear uh, how we approach a third-party assessment from the viewpoint of me, the monitor, but also the viewpoint of the monitored, uh, how they thought about this at the beginning, uh, their fears, their uh, uh, hesitations about having a monitor, uh, what kinds of agreements we worked out and how we did the work, and what they've gotten out of it so far. And while I have a, an outline of what I think he's going to say, uh, and in fact, I think it's a very positive thing that the president of the company is actually here um, to talk about it. Uh, I offered it to the compliance officer, and the president said, no, I would rather speak. It is interesting. Uh, yeah, so it, it sort of addresses the DOJ's uh, interest in ensuring high-level commitment. Right. And not only is, is the president of this company speaking, He's taking the Certified Compliance and Ethics Professional International exam here wow. in Prague after the conference uh, because he's that committed to doing things the right way. Uh, and isn't that what we want as a result of deferred prosecution agreements and these things for companies to not just uh, check the box and right. create a, a fig leaf of a program, but to truly, from the top down, uh, commit themselves to doing business in the right way. So having uh, worked under a monitorship, I uh, will be very interested to hear uh, the CEO's perspective. Sounds, uh, sounds fascinating. So Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, sit down and visit with me. Um, if anyone wanted to contact you via email about uh, anything you've talked about, could they email you? And if so, how would they do it? Absolutely. Uh, contact me at efeldman, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, at affiliatedmonitors.com. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you've listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us as it would help our rankings and also help us get the word out further to the broader business community about the FCPA Compliance Report. Also, 
If you have any questions you'd like answered in a mailbag episode, please email them to me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll listen to an upcoming episode of the FCPA Compliance Report.